I'll give you a chance to sing just a little bit. Our story is from the book of Luke. We're going to talk about that. And uh, probably most of you know the story from singing a song in Cradle Roll. So uh, we're all going to sing it together, right? Join me. Oh, Zacchaeus was a wee little man, a wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree for the Lord he wanted to see. And as the Savior passed that way, he looked up in the tree and he said, Zacchaeus, you come down, for I'm going to your house today, for I'm going to your house today. Well, that's pretty much the sermon in a nutshell, but we'll add a few things. Uh, I love looking at the background of uh, Bible books, and um, if you want two really helpful uh, translations or paraphrases that have the introduction to the that particular book in it uh, I have with me uh, Max Lucado's study Bible and he's written an introduction to each uh, chap or each uh, book of the Bible and then uh, the message Bibles also has a great introduction to each chapter um, I'm going to take time just to read one this is Max Lucado's and I thought it was very good Nearly 2,000 years ago, a doctor named Luke began a letter to a friend with these words. Inasmuch as many have taken in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us. It seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write to you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Now, I don't know if you realize Luke was the only Gentile of the um, followers of Jesus, the disciples. Have you, do you remember back in grade school when they were choosing up baseball teams and you chose two really good players to choose? And I'll take so and so, and then the next one I'll take so and so. Were you ever one of the ones that waited and waited and waited? <laughs> and you felt really wanted when the, oh, I suppose I'll have to take it. <laughs> um, maybe you've gone to a new school or to a new church, and they seem to have a little club, and you just didn't fit in. You weren't accepted. I hope not. But that may have been. Luke, he was the only Gentile among the Jews, but uh, he must have made a good student. He became a doctor, and uh, he's, he loved details, and so he, he did a research paper on all the witnesses that knew Jesus, walked with him, talked with him, and so Max Locata goes on. Luke and Theophilus shared two loves. Number one, a love for Christ, and a love for the facts. Heard a lot about facts recently, we haven't we? They didn't want legends, they wanted truth. And so Dr. Luke began to sort the truth and report the facts to Theophilus. The result is part letter and part research paper. It is part letter because it was written for a friend. What a bond must have existed between those two that Luke would labor so. It's part research paper, because Luke had studied everything carefully from the beginning, and he wanted Theophilus to benefit from his study. Can't you envision him in the home of Mary saying, tell me again what happened in Bethlehem? Can you see him peppering Matthew with questions? Let me see if I've got this parable right. Or on long walks with Peter, when you denied him the third time, did Jesus know? With the skill of a surgeon, Luke probes for truth. Why? So his friend could know that what he had been taught was true. Did Luke have any idea that millions of us would benefit from his study? I doubt it. All he did was share the truth with a friend. Can you imagine what would happen if we all did the same? 
Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, right? So we're going to go to Luke uh, 19. We're actually going to go through 10 verses. And uh, it's on the screen if you want to follow along that way. You might want to follow along in your own version. And um, I kind of like digging for facts too. And so we're going to slow down. I know we could read the 10 verses real fast. But Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. Do you know where Jericho is? I um, have one little map here. You can see that Jericho is real close to the Jordan River, uh, just above the Dead Sea. And I had the privilege of going to the Holy Land in um, 2006. And I decided to add another picture here. Um, what do they call one of these maps? topographical where you can see where the mountains are and where the valleys are and the ridge Jerusalem sits on a very high ridge and when we got in the bus and headed we were actually going to go down to the Dead Sea we floated in the Dead Sea we went down to Masada that you can see on the map there but as we left Jerusalem the best way to picture of it how many have been to at least a government camp up on Mount Hood Oh, no, most of you have. Do you remember your trip down? That's what it was like going from Jerusalem down to um, below sea level there, actually. And um, hills, just barren, very dry. And at that time, the, our guide said they actually did a stop because the, the hillsides were probably what... Uh, looked like what Jesus, um, well, there's the one I wanted. Um, as we came down the hills, we could see a nice little green spot in a bunch of barren hills. Now see that dirt in front, that mound? That's what most of the hills were like all the way down. And so to, uh, Jericho was actually an oasis, beautiful green area. We weren't able to go through that on our bus because it uh, definitely wasn't safe at the time. But it's, uh, you can see uh, the Dead Sea over there, um, and it's, it's just a green patch in the middle of desert. And that was Jericho. It was also right on the, the trade routes. And so um, a few miles, actually not too far from the Jordan River. And it's uh, spread out on the plain, and it was um, very luxurious. Um, so beautiful, palm trees, rich gardens watered by living springs, and it actually gleamed like an emerald among those limestone hills and desolate ravines that were between Jerusalem and the city of the plain. Many caravans passed that way, and their arrival was always a festive season. But now there was quite a stirring among the people because it was known that the Galilean rabbi who so recently raised Lazarus from the dead was in the throng and there were whispers as to the plottings of the priest. Jericho was also the home of the priests um, and the multitudes of course were eager to uh, pay homage to Jesus which made some of the priests very upset. At this time um, there were a large number of priests and residents there the city also had a population of a widely different character. Not only was it a great center of traffic, and on the, uh, it would be like, uh, you know, the, some of our interstates, um, no, it wasn't. It was as far as the main line, like I-5 up and down California, but it was more like 99, where you'd go through towns and towns, and um, Jericho was one of those. It was also a great center of the Roman officials and soldiers. And um, strangers from different quarters were found there traveling through. And so it was a great spot to be a tax collector because of the wealth and the luxurious. And um, we're going to talk about one of those. There was a man named Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus, you take your pick, we, we go with both. 
He was the chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich. Um, he had heard of Jesus and there's some thought that uh, Zacchaeus or Zacchaeus was not only a publican or a tax collector, um, but uh, his rank and wealth were abhorred by the people around him. Um, when, I, when I read this story and was reminded of who he was, it would, you know, as he walked the streets, there was such intense hatred because Jew was working for the Roman government, then fleecing their own pockets. They could, they had to collect what they had to turn into to Rome, but to pay themselves, they could, that's more, and that's, that's how they made their living. So they were very hated. I can just hear the crowds as he walks by, lock him up, lock him up. <laughs> um, but there was something even though a lot of the publicans um, were suspect, um, Zacchaeus had heard of Jesus. And there's some thought that um, something about this man and the kindness that he'd heard about um, touched his heart. And he was hoping one day to be able to see Jesus. Um, you know, when we read chapters he's in Jericho and I think the next scene you're back in Jerusalem so we don't get the distance there very well uh, just a few miles from there John the Baptist had actually preached um, and um, he tried to get a look at Jesus he heard this caravan was coming there was mobs and um, he wanted to see the teacher Zacchaeus was a wee little man he had a problem he couldn't see over the crowd. You can see uh, <laughs> um, a picture illustrating this. He's a little guy. And have you ever been in a crowd and you're trying to see something and then somebody big or wide or tall stands in front of you and you can't see around them? Well, that's probably how Zacchaeus felt. And so, ah, he had a solution. He was gonna go and climb up a sycamore tree. Uh, some versions say fig tree, some say sycamore dash uh, fig. So you can do a little research on that. He tried to get a look at Jesus, but he was too short. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree beside the road, for Jesus was going to pass by. He's up at the tree so he could get a good view. And when Jesus came by, scripture says, he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name. Zacchaeus, quick, come down. I must be a guest in your home today. Me? A publican? A tax collector whom everybody hates? Zacchaeus quickly climbed down and took Jesus to his house in great excitement and joy. These verses are from New Living Translation. He was so excited that he was actually not only going to get just to get to see Jesus, he was actually going to have Jesus in his home. He could ask him all those questions he wanted to ask. But the people were displeased. They were upset. And this is what they said of Jesus. He's gone to be the guest of a notorious sinner, they grumbled. Meanwhile, Zacchaeus, or Zacchaeus, Zacchaeus stood before the Lord and said, I will give half of my wealth to the poor. And if I've cheated people on their taxes, I will give them back four times as much. There's what I want you to look up. Luke 3.13, um, do we have somebody with a Bible that can read that for us? We have a microphone. Anybody willing to be a reader? Cheryl and Denny's show will continue. <laughs> <laughs> And he, he said to them, collect no more than what is appointed for you. So that was what John the Baptist was teaching. Because if you read the verses around it, um, it talks about, and, and doesn't it say who asked that? The tax collectors asked that question. So the soldiers said, well, what do we have to do? And other people ask different questions. 
and the tax collectors and perhaps who knows Zacchaeus might have been there at the Jordan River and uh, took that serious so Jesus responded salvation has come to this home today for this man has shown himself oh this really took upset the scribes and Pharisees this man has shown himself to be a true son of Abraham for the son of man came to seek and to save those who are lost aren't you glad he did that Amen. we're in that crowd too we're Gentiles most of us I'm so glad that Jesus is willing to look at me to look at you and say I want to be your friend. I'll come to your house if you'll let me in. Hearing these words reported to have come from the great teacher, Zacchaeus felt that he was a sinner in the sight of God. Yet what he'd heard of Jesus kindled hope in his heart. Repentance, reformation of life was possible even to him. Not one of the new trust or teachers, let me back up, wasn't one of the most trusted disciples of publican? And who was that? Matthew. So that gave him courage. Desire of Ages says, Zacchaeus began at once to follow the conviction that had taken hold upon him and to make restitution to those that he had wronged. And um, already he'd begun to retrace his steps when the news sounded through Jericho that Jesus was coming. He was determined to see him. He was beginning to realize how bitter are the fruits of sin and how difficult the path of him who tries to return from a course of wrong. To be misunderstood, to be met with suspicion and distrust in an effort to correct his errors was hard to bear. And the chief publican longed to look upon the face of him whose words had brought hope to his heart. Did this confession take place at his house, do you think? You know, it doesn't make it real plain. Um, we see that he was excited, but um, Desire of Ages tells a different story. The streets were crowded, and Zacchaeus, and he talks about him climbing the, the tree. The multitude gives way, and Zacchaeus, walking as if in a dream, leads the rabbi um, toward his own home. And they must have heard the crowd saying, he's going home with a notorious sinner. He was so overwhelmed and amazed in silence at the love of Christ and stooping to him so unworthy. Now love and loyalty to his newfound master unsealed his lips. And listen how the next paragraph begins. In the presence of the multitude, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, in the presence of, did you catch that? In the presence of? It wasn't in the house, it wasn't in privacy. In the presence of the multitude, Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I have taken anything away from any man by false accusation, I restore to him fourfold. And that's when Jesus said, This day is salva has salvation come to his, this house. He's also a son of Abraham. Verses go on to talk about, um, you know, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And uh, have you ever wondered about the verse, if, uh, you know, it's as hard for a rich man or harder for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven than for a camel to go through an eye of a needle? Well, that would be one gigantic needle, you're thinking, right? <laughs> but... I saw the old gates in Jerusalem, and what was interesting is they had a gate that about this high and wide and go down so that they wouldn't have to open this great and big gate to go in. They called that smaller hole where people could go in and out very easily the eye of the needle. So when it says a camel going through the eye of the needle, what did a camel have to do to go through that man-sized hole. They had to get down on their knees and kind of crawl through and they would do that when they didn't want to open the big gates. So uh, it tells you it's not impossible, it's just very, very hard. 
Well, I'm so grateful and I'm so thankful that Jesus still comes to the house of sinners and that he comes um, to seek and save those that are lost. Uh, we need to admit that ourselves. I had quite the experience last week. Worked long hours at the hospital. And I had a gentleman uh, ask for a chaplain to come and visit him. I found out he, he, the first day I went to see him, he said, the doctor has given me very bad news. He said, I, I only have days to live. Um, he said, I didn't always take good care of my body. I've done some wrong things. And uh, we talked a little bit about that. But then um, it was an interesting family situation. His first of four wives was the one that was his caregiver. And uh, he'd come back um, to be with her or she came to him to take care of him with the remaining days he had left. And uh, he said, Chaplain, I just want to know. He had listed no religious preference in his chart. He said, I'm not a very religious man, but could you tell me, is there an afterlife? Can you tell me what that's like? Boy, what an opportunity. I told him, I, we referred to Revelation 21, there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth where there's no more sin, no more dying, um, no more tears. And I said, it's for you. But Jesus doesn't force that on us. There's another verse in the Bible that says, behold, I stand at the door and I knock. You just have to open the door and invite him in. And he thought about that a little bit. Didn't say much. I didn't want to press. Um, and after we visited that day, um, I met with the staff. And we were trying to figure out, we learned that because of the medication that he was on, keeping his blood pressure off, when he went off it, it would just sink. Um, and I met later that week with the, somebody representing palliative care to talk to him a little bit more about end of life and how one could plan for that, what you wanted it to look like. The challenge for him was we weren't sure um, that he would leave the hospital. And when we talked to him, he said, my goal is even if it's just for 10 minutes that I be home in my own bed with my 80 pound boxer <laughs> with me and my, my pillow that I got, even if it's just for 10 minutes, it would be worth it to me. So we went with the staff trying to figure out how can we get this man home? Is it possible? He'd have to be stable enough to make the trip from the hospital uh, to his home. And really the staff and the doctors thought within minutes of taking him off of the life support that he wasn't on a ventilator, um, but even with the medications, he had a port with the medications flowing that he wouldn't make it. Um, I shared with him a verse that um, I share with a lot of patients. I used to share it at camp with my staff and campers that got in trouble. I've told you that story, I think, before, but the verse is easy to remember. It's Exodus 14, 14. And the story behind it is when the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt, um, the firstborn uh, of the Egyptians and those that didn't paint the blood on the doorposts, the angels didn't pass over, which by the way is where the feast Passover comes from. And it was finally after the death of the firstborn that Pharaoh said, okay, get out of here, go. And they left. But then when they got to the Red Sea, uh, Moses, where do we go here? We're, and then they turn around and here's the Egyptian army and the chariots and the horsemen coming. They're in a, quite a jam. And God told Moses what to say, and that's this verse. My God will fight for you while you remain calm. Mm, what a powerful verse. 
tuck that one in, keep it handy. And I said, let's pray. I'm gonna be praying for you that God will fight for you and make this possible, make this wish come true. And he said, do you really believe so, Chaplain? Because he had gone on comfort care, he did decide to go on hospice and they were gonna try to get him home. Um, they moved him from the intensive care unit over to a regular floor bed on the Mother Joseph side of the building. And he hadn't died. In fact, he was still awake and alert and able to carry on a conversation. And he asked for me to come again. And that day was the day that he was gonna discharge to go home. And he said, could we pick up the conversation where we left it last time? <laughs> And I said, sure. Well, he was watching, it was on Sunday, and he was watching the Seahawks game, and he was real frustrated that uh, Russell Wilson just wasn't playing as well as he normally did, and the Seahawks were making some dumb plays and so on. And uh, so in the midst of that, he said, could we go back and discuss some of what we were discussing before? And I said, yes. In fact, I'd like to show you a picture. I said, have you ever seen that before? That's Russell Wilson, the quarterback of the Seahawks. He's not ashamed. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. He says so. In fact, he's holding up this t-shirt that says, all I need today is a little bit of Seahawks and a whole lot of Jesus. <laughs> Isn't that something? So as we talked about, was, he gonna, was the Lord going to answer his prayer and get him home where he wanted to be, I said, you know, I just had another picture pop up on my phone this week that I'd love to show you, and I did. What do you think of this one? Take my hand, we'll get through this together. He said, oh, that is powerful. And something that stirred within him, it was very interesting. He told me all about his work, and I haven't told you. He was a pilot of these... Um, big ships that come off the ocean and come across the bar into the Columbia. And the same taking them out. That was his full-time job. He did it close to 40 years where he would board these ships, go up to the pilot house. It takes a pro, it takes an expert because it's very dangerous. And uh, he said, you know, I loved being in control. And he said, with what's happening to me, I, I'm no longer in control. And he said, it reminded me of one time I was bringing one of these huge ships in, and all of a sudden something broke, the steering mechanism broke, and I, there was no way. And um, he said, fortunately, the ship came up, hit the beach, and then went back, and somehow I was able to maneuver it where it was supposed to be. He said, that made me think a lot. And in these last few days, I've been thinking about a picture that was in every pilot house of every ship I boarded, with the exception of the American ships. And I said, well, what does the, the, the picture look like? And he said, well, there was a young man at the helm, and there was a hand on his shoulder. There was somebody behind him with a hand on his shoulder, um, this hand, and there was another hand that was pointing like that. So real fast, I get on my phone. I said, was it this picture? Recognize that? Isn't that amazing that that's in the ship pilot house on most seagoing vessels? He said, I've thought a lot about that lately. And um, I pray that he will guide me through what's coming next. What a beautiful experience. I'm so glad a crusty old sea pilot whose language was foul and the first day when we talked together I told him the story of the thieves on the cross how they were making fun and making fun of this guy who claimed to be God when one of the thieves said there's something different about this man and had the nerve to say remember me when you come into your kingdom that also gave him a great deal of courage and hope I stayed and helped him get dressed when the EMTs arrived to take him to the ambulance. And he was able to stand on his own two feet, get onto the gurney, 
And um, I told him, now I make an appointment with all my patients. He said, you do? I said, yes. We live in the Northwest, right? That's my memory hook. Dennis, his, uh, his name happened to be Dennis, so we had some close connections <laughs> that way too. I said, Dennis, I wanna make an appointment with you. I plan on meeting you at the northwest corner of the Tree of Life someday. And um, he waved as he got on the elevator. And I plan to see that Dennis there as well. I hope that each one of you do. And we can go home praising the Lord and thanking him that he is willing to come to our house if we just open that door. Lord, I need you like never before. Father in heaven, we thank you not only the privilege that we have of inviting to you to our home so that you can lead and guide and direct us. Thank you the privilege we have and the freedom to still serve and worship you and learn from your word. And last of all, we thank you for the privilege that we can share the good news with others. I really believe that there are many that are really seeking and just waiting for someone to share the good news with them. And if the Lord picks me, if he picks you, maybe be ready to do that because the Holy Spirit walks alongside of us, will give us the words and the thoughts and the actions. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen.